everyone. I think we can we can start. Possibly we'll still be receiving more attendees uh, coming from the coffee. Um, thanks a lot for being here. It's the last uh, round of sessions before the end of the day. It's been a long day, I believe, full of very interesting presentations and, and topics for discussion. But we leave the best for the end, uh, which is the in-situ topic, which has been already, um, let's say, a quite of a, a staple and uh, uh, pretty much in all the EOG workshops to discuss about and the role of in-situ and the issues about how to overcome um, the access to in-situ data, which is so relevant for the production of uh, Earth observation products and services. Um, my name is uh, Jose Miguel Rubio. Most of you know me, been in Eurogeo workshops for many years already. Uh, I work at the European Environment Agency. Um, now, recently, took over the role of coordinator of the what we used to be called Copernicus in situ component. Now it's called cross cutting access to. Um, uh, in situ data in the context of Copernicus program. No, cross cutting coordination of Copernicus access to in situ data. I need to say it correctly. Um, so uh, that fits very well in the matter of the discussion today, which is about, um, of course, in situ data is a huge topic. We could be discussing here about all the issues that we all have with in situ data. We want to focus uh, the discussion today in, in, in what could be the role or what should be the role of the Eurogeo initiative, the community in facilitating more availability, accessibility, and integration of in situ earth observation data. Um, why this session? Um, I mean, we, I mean, if you've been in several sessions uh, today, you have heard about all the issues that we have with in situ data. Um, I mean, it's, let's say, a key topic in, in all the different areas uh, because it's still a limiting factor uh, in order to exploit remote sensing data, uh, which is so necessary for validating uh, the products, for training the algorithms, uh, also for CalVal of satellite imagery. Um, yeah. So there is an issue of availability. There are issues about accessibility. Uh, there are issues. Uh, technical and, and legal, even when the data exists. We have issues on interoperability, we have issues of licensing. Um, I think things are evolving and we may discuss them later today, but uh, there is a clear fragmentation and complexity in the in situ landscape. But in Europe and in all the world, of course, we will focus more in Europe here. And our question, um, as part as well of, of, of an activity that the EA is, is carrying out together with uh, the InCase Consortium, led by Evenflow, together with NOAA, CREAF, OGC, is try to see how Eurogeo can contribute to address this issue. What is the role of Eurogeo in this context? Um, so that's why we wanted to bring in today um, in situ data users, data providers, intermediaries to discuss experiences, challenges, and possible solutions. We will not have a lot of presentations. We asked um, only basically examples from three, let's say three examples, uh, three presentations. We'll also have the intervention of, of uh, Phil uh, Harwood representing the InCase Consortium. And then we will have a panel discussion um, later on uh, where we try to go in more detail and, and try to, to discuss a bit the key issues and how, how we can address them. So I will not go into more detail. You have here the agenda. I will ask my the, the fellow speakers to, to try to keep to the time because we really would like to have uh, time for the panel discussion. Uh, remember that um, this is being shown in Zoom, uh, that we will be providing um, the PDF of your presentations if you have any issues about that, uh, let me know. And uh, yeah, I can only now start by introducing, the f let's say, the first speaker, um, Stefan Fritz from IASA, um, a familiar face, so I don't think he needs any uh, introduction, but um, yeah, he's been involved in so many projects related to uh, land use, land cover, citizen science, uh, yeah, and now you're going to speak about Evoland, right? So Stefan, if you want to come here. Yeah. 
Thank you very much, Jose Miguel Rubio Iglesias. You see, you pronounced my name so well, I can pronounce your name also very well. So <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, maybe we get up this presentation. This morning we had some hiccups. It's very nice to see you all, a lot of familiar faces. Thanks for still being interested so late in the afternoon in this session. As we know, in-situ data is increasingly becoming absolutely critical because AI is moving really fast and we can press a button now if we have good, very good reference and in-situ data, we can really make, make a, big, a big difference. Uh, the training data is, is what, what matters a lot. Um, I can use this, right? So let's see. Ah, wonderful. Um, so just to make us aware of the in situ landscape and what is really the, the name for it. So um, it's many times used also for non-satellite data, even LIDAR data is falling in some, uh, sometimes in that category. And also the term reference data is being used and for, I think for Copernicus and what Copernicus is doing, it has two meanings. On the one hand, this measurements, this traditional in situ measurements of temperature, weather, and so forth, but also on topographic maps. Um, and just coming back to the term reference data, I think we need more clarity on that term because in the US, specifically when they are validating, they use reference data only for validation. So they don't call it validation data, but they call it reference data being used exclusively only for validation. This is clearly not the case in our understanding of reference data. So there's clearly a difference. And I think the definition has widened over time. Um, also, you know, the emergence of, of other tools of crowdsourcing, of internet of things, um, and there will be many new sensors coming in, in, in the future, which will be probably a term then again in, in situ data. Coming back to Everland, you've maybe heard already or some of you a presentation by Ruben this morning in the session where Everland was more detailed uh, explained. Um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, uh, evolution of Copernicus services project, which has a strong also research component. Uh, responding to the new developments of automation and so the modularity of software and data products, the use and increased use of artificial intelligence and the moving towards more near real-time monitoring and data processing. Um, and there's lots of testing going on in Evolan, new methods, new tools, super resolution has been mentioned uh, um, on 11 candidate prototypes uh, places um, in the field of agriculture, forest, water, urban, and general land cover. These are the sites um, where these tests are being carried out uh, over Europe, but also French Guiana and Cote d'Ivoire are test cases. You can see these are quite small, um, small um, areas which are being um, checked. Uh, we, we, for that, we need also in situ data. This is the consortium is being led, led by Vito, and there's a lot of players within the uh, Copernicus landscape, as, as you can see, also quite a lot of companies being involved. Um, in this Evoland project, the task is really to evaluate and further develop in innovative data fusion, continuous monitoring, artificial intelligence, particularly also biomass mapping, and make use of novel EO and in no also novel in situ data to improve and develop um, new products um, in Europe and beyond um, as well. Um, and there are some tasks around novel data, um, both observation, but also in situ and training data uh, reflected then also in the deliverables. In particularly in Evoland, we make use of a lot of European well-known data sets such as Lucas, LPIs, Eurocrops is really, really useful. Um, has I think 16 countries on crop information. Um, National forest inventory data is critical, but it's not yet available in a lot of countries. There is really some need for access to those data and opening up of those data. 
Uh, then there is a project also Yase is involved in leading, it's called GeoTrees, that we provided also some data, but that's freely available, open biomass data, also pre preparing for the new biomass sensor uh, from, from the Commission and Europe. Then some data from Toprisa on French Guiana, LIDAR specific data we, we use for Sweden. Um, then we use any data available, anything which adds value, like OpenStreetMap, but there's also FluxNet. Flux data, GPP data available, and that's also uh, tested in, in this project. Specifically, we have quite good Swedish national forest inventory data. Again, there are some issues somehow with the visualization. I don't know why at the same this morning. Anyway, um, as you can see here, uh, Sweden is on the forefront of opening up this, this national um, in forest inventory data, and it's really setting a precedent and an example for the entire Euro Europe to follow because we can't really do good biomass maps with good reference and, and tr training data as well as validation data. Here are some examples of this geo trees. Um, it's also going to become a geo uh, activity, um, and th th there seems to be uh, also further development of this platform on uh, this geo trees. Another very interesting data set is Corda. Corda has a lot of topographic maps, um, on land monitoring, marine monitoring, atmosphere monitoring, emergency management, security and climate change. I think it's a really good initiative. Unfortunately, it contains also data which is not accessible openly. This is because some countries, they simply don't want to share certain data sets. But it's a mixture between open data compiled in Coda and these national data sets. Well, we, we were, so thanks also to Jose, allowed to look at it um, and it, it can be accessed by uh, Copernicus players as well. Um, it, it has, we checked in these pilot cases what's really available, what be, could become relevant for, for Everland and listed those. And there are some really interesting data sets in there, like tree species composition, for example, for Austria. Um, and, you know, maybe very good also national forest maps and so forth. Um, there is also, you know, sometimes there's digital data, but as you can see already, some is limited with the, res with the scale. So there is, of course, as with these topographic maps have a certain scale associated with it, which somehow then limits again the use for Sentinel based 10 pixel kind of training data, for example. So there are some limitations also clearly in those. But we are also supporting Evoland with um, our traditional um, kind of whatever we call it, uh, visual interpretation of very high resolution and time series data. You can see here um, our GeoWiki tool, where you can also see NDVI data over time, where you can see Sentinel time series. So there's also a time component to this. It's this tool where we try to access all other um, available very high resolution maps, but also other data. Also, we added planet data to this and we then collect. This is just one example uh, of a campaign we've run on the drivers of tropical deforestation, but this can be adjusted also to other needs, um, for example, in Evoland or other projects on disturbance, for example, of forest, forest management data can be collected through this tool and, and many others. Um, and we have been developing as part of Evoland also a new tool which takes more care of the deep learning needs of, of machine learning uh, to classify larger areas and to create segments based on these initial features we get from Sentinel. Um, and this you can combine and play around with these features and then create so-called clusters, um, which then create segments and they can be straight cl classified. And on the uh, lower right hand corner, you can then see already a classification, which can be then be submitted quite efficiently. Hopefully, once we develop this even further, it's still a bit an, on an experimental level um, as a label for water in this case, as you can see, right? So there is some new uh, ev evolvement also on novel ways of in collecting this kind of in-situ data and making in machine learning ready. Um, another interesting tool we have developed is a Street View tool. It uses Mapillary or Google Street View, where you can directly... Oops, that was a lot of glass. Um, where, where you can then directly um, 
see the field and label the field and you know where you are along the road um, and then label uh, yeah thanks I'm nearly done and then label the wheat field in this case most likely it's a cereal field for sure most likely uh, along those lines and we, we also build a uh, a tool, an interface where you can then provide information on these classes. You know the date, you can really uh, provide a lot of very useful information for crop type mapping using this tool whenever Street View and Mapillary is available. And last but not least, an app we've been uh, deploying is called Crop Observe. It lets you go out to the field. It can be used by experts or by citizens to collect um, Crop, crop specific uh, uh, data. Thank you. Ah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Uh, really very interesting activity for us, particularly as part of the Copernicus land team. We are really looking at what Evolan is, is preparing because it is really setting the roadmap for the future activities in this context. And it's also for us uh, but very important to know as well what are the different issues related to in situ data that can also be related to this evolution in the context of uh, Copernicus land. So we, we have here, um, let's say, the um, point of view or the example, the experience of, of, of uh, Evoland as, as setting up the, the roadmap for a future, uh, for future evolution on, of, of the an operational service. Uh, we'll have time for questions uh, in, during the uh, panel discussion. So I will just now invite uh, Helen Glaves to give us, um, let's say, his um, say point of view from the perspective of data providers. Um, Helen Glaves, I don't think she needs any introduction, but yeah, she's a senior data scientist at the British Geological Survey, but she's also very important in the geo community as one of the co-chairs of the in situ subgroup of the data working group and many other hats that you have, which I can Too many. lose track. <laughs> Please go ahead. Thanks ever so much for the, the really nice introduction, Jose Miguel. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I indeed do have a number of hats. Um, I'm, I'm a geoscientist by background and uh, as, as already mentioned, I'm, I'm uh, co-chair for the in situ subgroup. Um, but that's not actually the capacity that I'm going to speak in today um, because one of my other hats is that I'm actually involved with the European Plate Observing System, which is a research infrastructure for the solid earth. Um, it's been mentioned a couple of times in other pre presentations today, but I'm also vice chair of the board of the European Environmental Research Infrastructures. Um, so um, today I'm going to hopefully give a little bit of a, a flavour of the challenges for sharing data um, as, we, as we see them through the lens of the research infrastructures. But I am going to draw on some of the feedback that we received during the Open Data Open Knowledge Workshop. Um, in Geneva earlier this year because we've got a lot of really valuable feedback from data providers about what they think the challenges are in sharing data but also finding and accessing data. So hopefully I'm going to give a little bit of flavour of both in, in this very short presentation. Um, let's see if I can make this work. Ah, I should also say that I have to thank Anka Heinler at FMI um, because Anka has co-authored this presentation with me. She would have loved to have been here this week, but she's not able to be here. So it's fallen to me to, ooh, to give Perfect. our presentation. That was a bit quick. Um, so I want to just start off by, um, we've talked a lot about the climate change crisis already in the last few days. So I'm going, to, I'm going to use that as a starting point to say a few words about, firstly, about the, the role of the scientist, because data is fundamental for research. And in the hands of, of the scientist, data becomes information, it becomes knowledge, it becomes expertise and wisdom. And that's what's needed to address all of the challenges that are currently being faced um, by the planet, but also by society. And I think one of the fundamental um, tools that data, that scientists need is fair 
openly accessible, and I've heard this said several times today, trustworthy, high quality, and well-documented data and observations. And I think that's a message we've heard loud and clear in the last few days. Um, because these are really important assets for capturing the complexity of the Earth system, but also making sure that we can better understand the interactions between the atmosphere, the solid Earth, or rather the land, and the ocean. And we've heard even now in the Evoland presentation how important these observations are. But I think the urgency of tackling the climate crisis has actually highlighted the importance of interdisciplinary scientific collaboration as well. So it's not just about data quality, it's also about collaborating in ways that perhaps we're not used to. You know, many of us are worth a very experienced in working within our own fields, within our own disciplines, and not so much with working with people in other disciplines, particularly things like social sciences, which increasingly we are needing to work with social scientists, but actually many researchers in the environmental sciences still think that's a black art that they really, you know, they don't want to engage with. So what I want to do today is perhaps just say something about um, what are the challenges of, of sharing data. And I think one of the, the, the really important things to recognize is that um, we need to make data open and available so that it can be used in combination with data from other domains, including from the social scientists that some of us are quite terrified by but we need to actually address specific research questions that mean we're changing the way in which we work. So this has led to there being um, really two types of barrier to sharing knowledge and information. And Jose Miguel alluded to some of these in his introduction, but they can be broken down into two types. There's the cultural challenges, and we've heard a lot about those today, which relate to the people and the practices involved in capturing, validating, and delivering the data. But there are also the technologies and the standards that are used and sometimes misused by researchers to capture, deliver, and deliver the data and information. So, what I want to do is perhaps just drill down a little bit, I'm not going to be able to say a lot in 10 minutes, into some of these challenges and then perhaps say a little bit about how Eurogeo and Geo can help with tackling some of these challenges. I don't want to go into them in much depth because I think we've already exercised some of these in the other sessions today. But one of the messages that came out very clearly from the ODOC workshop in Geneva, well, there's actually a lack of awareness and, and, and or adoption of open science practices. And, and we're, there is still a challenge with getting researchers to make their data open and available. There are also various varying standards of data stewardship, which limits potential reuse. And in particular, there are issues associated with how we assess the quality of the data, but also making sure that the, late, the data has a proper license associated with it. Because in fact, not having a license in itself is a barrier to reuse. If you don't know as a researcher what you can do with that data, you're just not going to use it. So this in itself, most people say, oh, well, it doesn't have a license, so I should be good to do anything. Actually, no, it, most researchers don't work like that. There's also a reluctance to share data because of the perceived value. If you as a researcher think, well, my next grant, I could also base my next grant application on the fact that I have this data and no one else does, it becomes a barrier to sharing that with other people. But another message we got from the ODOT workshop is that there is a real concern that the original originator of the data is not getting the recognition that they deserve. And this becomes increasingly problematic as data is used in combination to produce data products. So this in itself becomes a barrier. But also there is a concern that there is actually poor visibility of the data and services themselves. And so there's this concern that data providers are once again not getting credit, their data's not being reused. 
It's also worth saying that institutional and national policies, rules and regulations are still an issue. Many institutions, and I have to say with the door closed, that my own institution is still struggling with the concept of open data because they still see a perceived value on holding the data and not releasing it so that we can generate the data products and sell them. That really is not an open data world. And I think it's also worth saying that in the context of the in-situ subgroup, we've been engaging with many of the geo work program activities. And one of the, the local challenges with regards to sharing of data is around, um, you know, there are specific local challenges. So for example, security of monitoring equipment. I had a conversation with someone in Africa who told me they have big gaps in their monitoring because their equipment's been stolen. And also, um, Stefan's just mentioned the challenges of resolution of data, and much of this can be related to protected species. Many, many, at uh, the national level, there are rules and regulations around protected species, which mean data, locational spatial data, is restricted. And all of these things make some of this data unusable. unusable. Oh, I went backwards, apologies. But there's also the technical challenges. I'm not going to, again, dwell on this. We've heard a lot about this already today in the various sessions. And I have to say, I was a bit boggled by the end of uh, some of the sessions today because I think the challenges are actually far more complex than even I'd recognised. But I think it's fair to say, if we want to boil them down to some genera general generalities, it's around inconsistent or domain-specific formats, vocabularies, some semantics, protocols, which all act as barriers to interoperability. There's a use of incompatible technologies and solutions. But there are also requirements for interoperability solutions to support inter and transdisciplinary research. And we're really struggling with that. And I think there's a lot of um, speciation, if we want to call that, in terms of the technologies that are being developed. And I'll come back to that in, in my closing remarks. Um, two minutes, that's good, because I have about two minutes. Okay. So what I want to say, I'm, I'm going to digress slightly now from, from GEO, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about ENVRI, which is the Environmental Research Infrastructure Cluster in Europe, because um, ENVRI is basically an act, a coordinating activity which is aiming to reduce the heterogene, heterogeneity in the data landscape in Europe. And there, this is being done by trying to have greater coordination and harmonization of data tools and services for the environmental research infrastructures in Europe. And so basically these, key, these environmental research infrastructures are based around life, air, land and water. And I mentioned EPOS, so EPOS is one of those. So really what um, the ENVRI cluster is trying to do is to make sure that all of the very large amount of data that's being curated, if we want to use that word, by the research infrastructures is, making, is being made as widely accessible as possible and trying to address the challenges of interoperability at the domain level. You can imagine how challenging this is because at the moment, I have to get the number right, we have 26 research infrastructures in the ENVRI cluster. And many of the RIs are very specialized in their own particular disciplines and domains. And so they are very much focusing on their core tasks to ensure they're catering to their specific user communities. However, the additional focus is on interoperability between the different research infrastructures. Obviously, I can't say too much about this in the talk, but if, if you want to ask me a bit more about the technologies we've been employing, then I'm more than happy to say a little bit more about this. But what I will say is the approach we've taken is about optimizing the resources to try and deliver tailored services and efficient operations to support research. I think this cluster of research infrastructures de demonstrates how collective actions can resolve the technical and cultural differences. Envry hasn't fixed everything, but we, we've gone a long way down the road, so we are working very closely as a community. But I want to just use the last minute or so of this talk to say a little bit about how can GEO support efforts to, to really increase sharing of data, perhaps based on that collaborative model that the, re the clusters of research infrastructures are using. ENVRI is not unique as a cluster. There are many clusters in Europe and, in fact, internationally. Oh, that's 
Oh, I'm going to get. I forgot that. Got <laughs> animation. That's what happens when I borrow slides from Anchor. Um, so, what are the key actions for for the regional geos? And so, obviously, we're here in the EuroGeo workshop. So one of them is promoting open sharing and reuse of data. This is quite fundamental, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here, but I think there is a role for EuroGeo in making sure that we are actually promoting good practices and good data stewardship. We need to be advocating for community standards, both at the regional and the global geo level. We need to make sure that protocols and policies support interoperability and the creation of high quality data products. We've heard a lot about some fantastic things that are happening already. We need to be thinking about facilitating cross-discipline dis actions and discussions to identify common priorities for data sharing. So for example, um, defining of essential variables. One of the things we heard in Geneva is many of the essential variables are common to different disciplines and what's missing is the conversations between the different communities. So for example, this is a, a fantastic slide that uh, Anka put together that demonstrates the, uh, the, the, the collection of essential variables that GCOS have put together that are actually being adopted across a wide range of different communities. So these essential variables are not being used just in one area, they are being adopted more widely. And I think this definition of common variables is, is one of the conversations that EuroGeo needs to promote. Jose Miguel is looking at me because I've run out of time, but this is my last slide, Jose Miguel. Um, the other thing that I think is important, the data providers are really concerned about the visibility of their data and services. There's a role in promoting those for GEO and for the regional GEOs, because the regional GEOs can make sure that in, in their areas, people are aware of what's available and what they can use. We also need to be thinking about gathering requirements for data and knowledge and information. Alba um, and Joanne have been working on the GREX tool, and if you didn't see the demo outside, if you're here tomorrow, please do ask them, because this is a perfect example of what GEO can do to facilitate requirements gathering. But lastly, I think the other important thing to highlight is that GEO and the regional GEOs can really support the GEO work programme activities and other related initiatives who are working towards integration. The one thing I want to highlight is many of the research infrastructures in the Envery cluster are participating organisations in GEO, but are not exposing their data via the GEO support platform at this time. And EPOS is one of those, but we are working on that. But I think this is an important aspect of how the regional and the global geo can really capitalize on the data that's out there. We need to get more of the research infrastructures involved. So I think my final message here is there's a lot here that the regional geos and geo as a whole can be doing to improve and break down those barriers to data sharing. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Helen. I mean, it, it was great because we, we also got a summary of key outcomes of this in situ session that we got, uh, we had at the Open Data, Open Knowledge Workshop. And also, it's good to really highlight the value of uh, research infrastructures, which are in many cases under, underfunded, and how they are contributing not only to science research, but actually operations. So it's, it's important to, to, to discuss and to see how Eurogeo could play a role here. Um, let's uh, move on to uh, Paolo Mazzetti. Uh, we, are, we have heard about data providers, let's say, research infrastructures. We have heard about needs for in-situ data from the evolution of a, of a, of a service. Um, now we are going to hear a bit the connection between both of them. Uh, Paolo Mazzetti, let me just my notes. Uh, he's, yeah, is a research scientist and head of division of Florence of CNR Institute of Atmospheric Pollution um, Research. Yeah, and uh, he's involved in many projects. I mean, uh, <laughs> I was control either, but also very importantly in the uh, in the GeoDAP, which is at the core of the Geos infrastructure and many other things. Please. Thank you, Jose Miguel. Yes, in my uh, presentation, I would like exactly to highlight a bit the role of data intermediaries 
to facilitate the interaction between uh, in situ data users and the providers. So the, the, the idea that, the, the, let's say, the messages that I would like to give is what is the role of intermediaries, including values, but also issues in introducing intermediaries in the, say, knowledge generation flow. And also highlight some uh, uh, previous experiences where actually the intermediaries are part uh, and uh, this role is actually put in practice. And also I would like to uh, conclude uh, uh, showing how this uh, role of intermediaries is already considered in uh, the, uh, let's say, in the great project which is the preparatory action for the Green Deal data space. So first of all, I would like to uh, highlight some of the many challenges of in-situ data sharing where actually intermediaries can have a particular role. Uh, Helen actually already talked about many, the many, many challenges of in-situ uh, data sharing. And also I would like to have a bit of comparison with the work already done in the past decades about uh, satellite remote sensing data because actually if we look at the major challenges are they are the same but actually in in situ in a certain sense they are at a higher level because for example in uh, remote sensing uh, uh, let's say satellite based remote sensing they are mostly uh, coverages at least the most used are, are coverages which means for example imageries while, for example, in in situ data sharing, we have a greater variety, including, for example, different types of, of data. And Stefan mentioned observation and reference data, but also many different feature types. We have profiles, we have trajectories, and and so on. And of course, the the, the usual heterogeneity in terms of formats, coordinate reference systems, resolution, and so on. Also. Another big challenge is in terms of policy. And uh, while on uh, remote sensing data there was a long uh, work, and in particular now we have a clear trend of uh, free and open data sharing for public uh, uh, data sets, and also the commercial provider have a clear policy for distribution. This is not uh, always true for uh, in situ data set. Helen mentioned before that in many cases there is not a clear policy associated with in situ data sets. And we have also many different cases. For example, uh, in, in the research activities, there is always often an embargo time required for publications. Uh, there are other aspects specifically related to the commercial value of some in situ data. For example, some biodiversity data uh, for fisheries are uh, not provided because of their commercial value. And uh, of course, there is the problem of privacy, for example, for some citizen science collected data. And uh, also, there is a big impact, as uh, again Helen mentioned, of the new regulations on data sovereignty, data privacy, data ethics. Also, in terms of accessibility, there is uh, quite a big uh, difference because uh, while uh, remote sensing data are commonly distributed by the, 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 the producers and owners, and also many uh, existing clouds provide uh, a large collection of data sets. In the in situ data set scenario, it's a bit difficult. There are also small organizations, including uh, small research centers, which don't have the possibility to manage their own repository. So we have big uh, problems of accessibility of many valuable uh, data sets. So, how intermediaries can help this? Uh, data intermediaries are third parties that mediate between data producers or providers and the data users. And actually, they work at different levels. They could be just the organization acting as intermediaries, or they may have also tools facilitating the interaction. And you can see, I don't know if the pointer works, uh, the situation without the intermediaries and the situation with an intermediary. So, for example, one uh, activity where intermediaries can be useful is on the harmonization of metadata and uh, data. In, um, actually, in many aspects. One is on reducing the complexity, 
because without intermediaries you need to have m times n agreements between the users and the providers and actually all the burden of interoperability is upon either the producer or the user while with an intermediary you have uh, uh, a smaller um, uh, complexity because you need only m plus n agreements from each provider and each user with the intermediary and also you have you can apply the so-called separation of concerns pattern which means that you have one element that is dedicated to interoperability so you set free producers and consumers by most of the interoperability uh, issues and uh, actually another interesting aspect is that uh, the intermediary can provide uh, added value so for example you could provide something like metadata augmentation or uh, any kind of transformation uh, during the transfer of course there are also drawbacks for example since uh, this is done at level of intermediaries in some cases uh, the let's say harmonization can be suboptimal for example it's very interesting that is mentioned by Helen is in multidisciplinarity but often it could be suboptimal for intra-community but it's very, it could be very fine solution for multidisciplinary uh, interoperability and uh, of course you have multiple transfers which is another uh, drawback for with intermediaries and another potential drawback is that you have a logical single point of failure if the intermediary uh, actually doesn't work the interoperability becomes not possible and uh, but also another potential role for intermediaries is to providing open repositories for addressing this uh, challenge that i mentioned before of uh, uh, data in situ data which are not accessible so uh, we have uh, at least a couple of experience where we personally in cnr were involved where actually data intermediaries are, have a, a clear role. One is GEOS, where uh, most of you know there is a GEOS platform which is based exactly on this mediation approach. The GEOS platform has different components. I would like to focus on the technical interoperability provided by the GEODAP, was mentioned by Ellen in the slides, so thank you. And uh, the GEODAP is a, is a broker, is a mediator, which actually implements a tenth of uh, different specification and profiles to connect currently more than 200 data inter um, infrastructures and data sources so they are heterogeneous but they are harmonized by the discovery and access broker it supports uh, standard but also legacy and proprietary interfaces exposed by these infrastructures and uh, on the other hand it exposes standard interfaces and apis to connect the different clients including the geos portal the community portals and uh, doing this actually uh, it provides also some uh, value added services it provides the possibility of transformation which means reprojection and uh, resampling reformat and so on and bulk download so collecting data from different infrastructures um, in geos we have uh, several satellite based remote sensing data but also uh, some in situ data collections another example is based on the same technology is the wmo hydrological observing system which is actually uh, implemented in three regional systems, Plata, Arctic at global level. And here, most of data are in situ, uh, coming from monitoring stations. And uh, we support uh, multiple clients with these APIs and interoperability with the general WMO information system. Uh, as I said, I would like to mention that we consider the role of intermediaries in the uh, let's say preparatory action for the green deal data space through the great project some of you were already in the in the session on great just to mention that uh, um, great is considering data intermediaries already at the governance level as uh, one of the uh, actors categories 
and also in the technical blueprint, uh, we consider uh, the some logical building blocks that we call the facilitators that can be provided exactly by intermediaries for addressing uh, uh, some of the challenges that I mentioned before. And uh, so uh, going to the conclusion, uh, in situ data sharing challenges are similar to those that were already addressed for remote sensing, but at a higher level. Um, based on uh, these previous experiences, intermediaries can help to address uh, data interoperability uh, challenges, of course, with uh, some, also some issues in particular in terms of governance of having new actors in, uh, involved in the, in the data sharing. We don't see major technical issue, mostly due to the uh, work done by the community in uh, defining their own community standards, for example, and uh, adopting, for example, mediation for multidisciplinary interoperability. And major issues are actually in terms of governance and sustainability problem. Let's go. Thanks a lot. Uh Uh, we will discuss uh, in, in a few minutes a bit more. I think it will be interesting to, to hear a bit the, uh, as part of the, the great project, what is, what is a bit more your views about the in-situ context and also what will be the, what do you think will be the impact of the high value data sets as well, which I think it will be very important for this community, uh, how this will uh, yeah, proceed and how this will evolve. But before going to the panel discussion, I want to uh, introduce the last presentation of uh, today, which is uh, done by Phil, uh, Philip Hargut, uh, who is a consultant at Evenflow, who has a very long experience in the space industry, and he's involved in also a number of projects. Uh, Evolan, for example, and also assisting the EA in, in our in situ activities. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll be very brief. This is not really intended so much as a presentation in its own right. It's more of some seed questions to get the discussion going in a minute when we move to the panel. Just as a background, so I'm project manager for the InCase project. This is actually some supporting EA in supporting the commission in order to do their, to support the work of GEO. Um, for the most part, we are focused on supporting GEO, but we have one particular task, which was to look at how EuroGEO could potentially serve as a facilitator in the context of the complex European Institute data landscape. Um, this is just a slide to show different in situ initiatives within Europe. I think there's nothing here that we haven't already discussed. I've used a slightly different terminology, data brokers instead of intermediaries, but uh, other than that, I think it's more or less standard. Um, we have talked to several people, including many of the people I see here, about what the common issues are around the sharing of data, both from the user side and from the provider side. I'm not going to read all this out because I think it's very much duplicating what has already been said by the previous speakers and in other sessions of this. So what I would like to just focus on very quickly is the question, what could EuroGeo potentially do about this? And we've tried to summarize this into four potential recommendations, which I throw open to the panel in a minute. But one obvious action is simply to capture all these disparate user needs and capture all the data in order to facilitate matching between the needs and the data that are out there. This is something that Juan and Alba have already started within the GREX tool, and it would be a natural evolution of the work that is done there. Another, word, another action that EuroGEO can potentially make is to, on the repository side, ensuring a suitable repository for providers. Again, GEOS is already something that is supported here, but obviously it's not perfect. Helen mentioned that EPOS doesn't make their data available through GEOS, so there would need to be some sort of feedback mechanism in order to understand the needs of the providers and what are these blocking points and in 
give the input to the repositories. Similarly, the actual providers of data may need help in figuring out how to get their data onto the portal. Another potential action that you could, you could take, we, we've mentioned different data sharing policies, different licensing conditions, and this is again something where Eurogeo could potentially help, giving some specific templates, some specific examples that people can take and use. This would need to be enforced. Um, somebody would have to make sure that these templates are used, which would mean that the the funding bodies would need to be involved here. And finally, um, we're all here, we're all talking together, and I think this is the final action for Eurogeo, provide a forum for key players to coordinate actions, either as a less focused session like the one we're having, or as a more focused action group, where we can bring the users, bring the providers, bring the data brokers together in order to talk. It would need to be seen again by the organisations as something with real value, not just a talking shop. Those are some potential actions that we can discuss in a few minutes. Um, one thing I will throw open is a couple of open issues as well to be discussed. One is who is this being done for? And Eurogeo is the European contribution to Geo, but then there are also some specific European issues that need some degree of coordination, like the Green Deal data space. So where is Eurogeo fitting in here? Are we fitting in primarily as the input to the global geo, or is this more of a European action addressing European problems? And then the final one, which is, again, for discussion, there are so many initiatives, there are so many working groups where is Eurogeo really adding value and where is it just adding an extra level of complexity onto what's already recognized as a very complex ecosystem? So I don't have the answers, but I'm throwing open the questions and I think yes. uh, Jose can now pass over to the panel yeah. to discuss these points. Perfect, Phil. Uh, indeed, we will be uh, discussing these questions and other questions that we have prepared. What I will now ask is the panelists to sit here. I will just move to the, to the pulpit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, I would like to invite uh, Nuria uh, Castella and Elnas Ninavas to sit as well with us. Um, so the idea is to now to have a kind of a round discussion. We have prepared some questions, but of course also feel free to, to put questions. I have a few to warm up the discussion, uh, but first I would like to give the floor to um, to the two uh, panelists, which have not uh, spoken yet. I will first uh, give the floor to uh, Nuria Castell, who is a senior scientist at uh, NILU, uh, who is working in air quality and also is working particularly in the context of uh, citizen science. I would like just to ask you for a couple of minutes just to introduce yourself. Also, how do you see in particular the context of citizen science data, in situ data coming from uh, citizens in this overall uh, let's say, landscape, uh, yeah, and also a bit feeding into what we have been discussing today. Thank you. So my name is, is Nuria. I, I work at, uh, at NILU in Norway, and uh, I'm coordinating the group there on technology and society. And my uh, research interest comes and also in how to use citizens' data, how to make it more uptaken, how to enlarge the uptaken of data. And I've been listening to these talks today, and I see like there is like many, many points that are common also with the citizen science data that is also common to this other in situ data, like interoperability, the necessity of uh, standards in order to, to guide the people how to use this data. But there are also other issues that are very, um, very characteristic of citizens' data, citizen-generated data. And uh, some of the particularities, um, for example, they were saying, Helen was saying, like, we need high quality data. And here, citizen data is not always perceived as high quality data. However, it still can help us a lot towards the challenges we are facing. So we need to somehow change some mindsets here on 
the use of citizen generated data by the scientific community. Other of the, of the issues also is like um, how to acknowledge, you were saying like we need to acknowledge the data providers, right? But how we acknowledge citizens, we have like a, a plethora of citizens that are contributing with their own sensors, how to acknowledge that. Another of the issues that was also mentioned is like also like um, how this uh, data and, and the GDPR and the privacy and the security that is t very tackle very different points when we talk about citizen data. So, so some common issues, some also very particular, and we hope the GEOS can help us here. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Nuria. Definitely, I, I could see, I mean, having also been linked to the citizen science community, let's say, with following up all the citizen observatories, that the Eurogeo has, I think it could be a, a very good for a forum, let's say, to discuss all these issues about standardization, or at least uh, making sure there is interoperability, providing guidelines, uh, because I don't think there are, there is really a forum, let's say, or any other place. Of course, there are associations, the European Citizen Science Association, which is working also on this type of activities. But in the context of Earth observation and how this can support, I think Erogeo could be a very good uh, place to, to discuss these issues. I would like now to give the floor to uh, Dr. Enna Sneinavas. Uh, she's an assistant professor uh, at the faculty of ITC in the University of Twente, and she's been also involved in several geo-related uh, projects. I would just like to, to give you the floor also to, to provide us with some feedback and how do you see as well that your geo could play a role also in, in the context of, of the activities that you are doing in, in the, uh, at the university. Uh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, the presentations. Um, as you, I, I just want to quickly introduce myself. I'm Elnaz Neyna, I was from ITC. I'm, I'm assistant professor. I'm very much involved in um, retrieval of uh, essential biodiversity variable using your data. But um, the struggle is real when we come up with the using in-situ data, particularly at the larger scale. At the local scale, we are always rely on our networks, or we do our uh, own field works and collect our own city data. But when we want to scale up and come up with the global um, products, uh, we always have an issue. But what I found here in uh, during this, in this sessions that uh, since late 2016, that uh, uh, I'm involved in uh, your particularly Horizon project, I see that the, the points that raise here is repeating. So uh, more or less, we are struggling for past six or seven years, and we are talking about the same thing again and again and again. So I haven't seen the solution yet uh, to how we have to address. Even I was involved in one uh, Horizon Euro project that very much was in system of, uh, uh, of using institute data that we never ever received, and eventually we contacted our um, our uh, collaborator from our network to come up with the institute data. Um, so we have to be a little bit more proactive from the presentations that uh, I just uh, heard here. Uh, that uh, we have to echo these uh, issues. Uh, by talking more, by uh, by emphasizing uh, based on law or uh, come up with the new regulation, I don't know, but we have to do something for that. We need institute data. This is not the issue that will gone quickly. All of us in this room, I'm sure that in uh, some part of our work, we always rely on institute data to to uh, calibrate or validate our products. So uh, it is with us for a while. So we have to really find a solution. Indeed, I, I was going to say something similar before uh, that uh, I feel a bit like kind of a, well, I don't know how to say in English, but this day that repeats again and again and again. <laughs> because we keep speaking, yeah, voila. Uh, we keep uh, speaking about the same issues. Uh, I'm not quite uh, on the same page in the sense that we don't do anything. Um, I think, uh, well, I can speak from my, with my heart of lead of the Copernicus in situ component or the new name, um, uh, that we really, I think we are advancing. Uh, it's, it's really 
I would say a bit of a painful uh, work. Um, at least I can speak in the context of the Copernicus program how much we have been working with networks. Uh, for example, I can speak about the Eurogeographics, which uh, represents the national map in the cadastral agencies uh, in Europe, with whom we have signed recently uh, an, up, an extended agreement. So Copernicus services can get access to uh, data from the national mapping agencies for production validation of this of the products. Of, it's, it's a step forward. It's not we are not speaking about open data, but uh, we are at least uh, making sure that this data is available, at least in the context of Copernicus. The same uh, with UMetNet. We also have a framework agreement. Um, yeah, I would definitely think that we 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 are uh, progressing, and I think. Um, um, the, um, the regulation on the high value data set. That, in my opinion, will be a, a clear, um, let's say, turning point on getting access to this, uh, to, to a large name, number of geospatial, environmental observation, statistical data, meteorological data. Now, how the member states will uh, implement this and take into account that this only applies to EU members. Uh, but we hope we set a blueprint for other countries to to um, to follow suit. Um, I would like. Can you uh, put uh, the slide of Phil again? Because I would like to go back to the suggestions that uh, Phil had in the in the slides. Uh, is this just the last one? Yes, because I would like to. Um, um, I, 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 before I ask more questions, maybe I would I should give the floor to you. If you have any burning question, otherwise I will just proceed to warm up more discussion. But um, if there is anyone who would like to react on the, yeah, Franz, uh, please. Yes, thanks. Um, thanks for this. Uh, working? Yes. yes. For these uh, nice presentations and uh, for this discussion, which I think is a very interesting one, and the points you've raised are, are very pertinent uh, uh, questions. Um, I so I really like to engage in the discussion, but to ask a question or to raise one point is about these intermediaries, which I think is a very very relevant aspect, and I do believe there's there's need for intermediaries. And actually, I like the word much better than a system of systems or something that is on top of all the others, but something that really connects dots. Um, and I, I was missing a bit in the discussion we had in the previous session on the data spaces, the role of these intermediaries that is actually mentioned in the data space regulation. And and we, we have not really touched this point, that's why I want to raise it, is this question of trust, which has actually two sides. One is for the users of the data, they go there and they trust that the data has a certain quality, probably, or that that is reliable data. So that's the one side. But there's also another side, which is from the from the suppliers. They trust that the data there is handled in a proper way. And there's now more and more with IoT things coming in. There's GDPR questions. There's data um, privacy questions that have become very important. And there's actually the big role, I think, of the media. What I call intermediaries Intermediate, yeah. <laughs> in the in the data space. Of course, there's also another question of trust, which is, and that's I think you raised the point, is that I've given my data there. They're not kind of uh, rebranded, and I don't have any visibility anymore. And somebody uses the data and doesn't know that where the data originally comes from. That's also an important aspect. Thank you. Yeah, May please, I? Please, yeah, Paolo, yeah. Yes. No, I, I think you touched at least a couple of important points. One is to fold the dimension of trust. In the data space, not just the Green Deal data space, there is a lot of focus on trust in terms of transfer of data. So to be sure that the organization involved are authorized on, on that exchange. But as we were discussing now, there is also the aspect of having reliable information, which is, I, I think, very, very important. And uh, I would like also um, to answer to Nuria uh, about the quality of the citizen science data. I think probably in many cases, the quality is, of course, lower than uh, those coming from uh, organization. But what is important, I think, is to document the accuracy. 
and let the users to decide if they can consider them reliable depending on the, on the, on the specific use case. And uh, on, uh, on the other aspect that is uh, how we envision this role in the data space uh, is also twofold. I mentioned it a bit in the, in the presentation. One is in terms of actors. So in the governance uh, uh, aspects, we considered the three main uh, let's say, uh, actors as the providers, the users, but also intermediaries. And that's part also of the general idea of the digital ecosystem, which is exactly on allowing stakeholders to contribute with, for example, new technologies that can help to bring things uh, together. By a technical point of view, we are more involved, of course, in, in technical aspects. Uh, we introduce uh, this concept of facilitator, which is exactly the idea to have logical components that can help providers on one side and users on the other side. So that's basically the, the, the idea that perfectly agree that intermediaries have a big role. Thank you. Um, you want to, yeah, yeah please, I, so I, go I ahead just, and bring it um, I just want to quickly add something. Um, in a previous life, I, I did a lot of work on interoperability between different marine research infrastructures around the world. And one of the biggest challenges was interoperability. And I don't know how long the Geodab broker has been around, but that was at that time was seen as groundbreaking, but seen as essential to actually address some of the issues of interoperability. It was mentioned here that we keep coming around the same questions, but I think some of the solutions have been around for quite a while. I can't remember when the Geodab first... Yeah, something like that, that would be about right. Yeah, that would sound about right. But I think it's important to recognize that this concept of intermediaries is, is something that um, has been recognized, has a real value for some time. I also wanted to quickly comment on, on Nura's mention about citizen science as well. I think there is this preconception that citizen science is not of high quality, as high quality as research data. But I think the real question is, how do we handle citizen science? And we, I've been involved in a number of conversations around assigning confidence to different types of data to allow users to evaluate whether they want to use that data. So it's really just a quality flag. But where there are clear gaps in the data, that might be the only data that's that's available. So it's actually about giving the user all of the information they need to make valid use of that data, whether it's high quality observational data or it's data that is perceived of being of lower quality because it's, let's not call it citizen science because I think it's a much broader field. It's collected by non-experts because I think there's also some other marginal data as well. There are a number of uh, words and terms which we Absolutely. should not get into that yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. Just one example concerning citizen science. We are in a project where ECMWF was providing a repository for citizen science and we had a stop basically of that activity for some months because they were not sure that they were enabled to redistribute those data according to the GDPR. So that's also a problem related to policy. Yeah, licen licensing is always an issue and that's why documentation, well, we, having worked with metadata for many years, I know how important this is that. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, Stefan, and then I don't know if someone has questions. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. No, I just would like to raise two points. They are quite different though, but just coming back to the citizen science data, since we touched upon that topic, I think we have to be very careful that we don't come up with some general rules, like the data is not as good as expert data. I would say it really always depends and where we can agree upon is that it for sure varies a lot depending on the application. So. You know, we can have passive data collection. We can have like sensor-based citizens data. So it's not the citizen, it's the quality of the sensor which matters, right? So PM sensor is put somewhere, it measures the PM at that location. If the sensor is good, the citizen science data will be good. If the sensor is bad, 
there might be some relationship to where it's pulled, how it's pulled, how it's dealt with. That's that's correct. But there is also this component of the of the sensor quality. Um, but also, I think we have to not neglect the training aspect. So what we've seen is that if you train citizens over time, on, if you have a close meshed monitoring by experts and you have a close interaction between experts and non-experts, the non-expert can get as good as the expert eventually and it's a time question. So I think just this I think is very important in that respect. But coming back to the more important uh, question we are discussing here, and this is really access to data and We've seen that in, in many different um, presentations, really interesting barriers you've kind of pointed out, which I fully agree are really there. And it's many times related to competitiveness. So the scientist doesn't make it available because the scientist wants the next grant or wants the science paper, by the way, the, the high level nature paper. That's why a lot of researchers don't make data available because they only can do it. They are the only ones who have exclusive right to amazing data. That's still a big problem, but the, the solution, I think really part of the solution is what you have mentioned is on the donor side, you know, really educating the donors because many times the donors, they have no idea, philanthropists, I'm not saying they are bad, but they are not really diving deep enough into the importance of specifying in their calls that all data produced in that project has to be open. And that's not enough. It has to be followed up and there needs to be people checking if it's really done what is promised and there needs to be really data whatever on the side of the donors there really needs to be people who do the checks if the data promised is then also available and ideally you want to even already say where the data can be stored where the repository is where the data should be put and the more guidance you can provide from the donor end the more clear you will be on how much data you will get. And you will also remove the competitiveness automatically because indeed, you know, we, we, are, we are a little bit in a difficult situation because we have Copernicus. Copernicus is mainly to 80% carried out by company. If I'm a company, I think competitively, I generate myself as a company in situ data, I will not share it. Why should I? Because another company can take up this in situ data and generate equally good products I do. So as a com my commercial interest, if I want to stay at the forefront, I would not share the data. Why should I? So if the donor makes it clear from the beginning, this grant comes with an automatic delivery of all data or even the whole workflow of the generation of the maps needs to be open and transparent. One example would be, for example, ESA's World Zero project, where also we've been involved. The data is open, the workflow is open, the algorithm is open, everything is anyway open. Yeah. Then it's then it's clear and we have part of the solution. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, let's get the floor to, um, yeah, I would also have things to say on that. I think we are also, in Europe at least, trying to, to push for that in the context of the Horizon program. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, my friend Soas, I, and then we will go to rest it, but yeah. <laughs> well, on ahead. what has been said before, um, in the systems I know, on the operational real-time systems, most of the time there is an intermediary that um, at minimum and re-encodes the data into a, a homogeneous uh, format to allow a faster uh, processing afterwards. Uh, but they also sometimes uh, implement some um, consistent uh, controls on the values because on, for in situ you can have a lot of errors. So these are the things you can do at uh, the intermediary uh, level. And um, and also, well, there was something else. Oh, yes, and also for the data privacy, they can implement some anonymization or fuzziness on the geolocation, things like that, in a consistent way over all the data they, they centralize in the hub. Uh, in the research context, um, what we have seen in NextGeos and then in eShape is that the data providers are very sensitive to be credited correctly. Uh, so even if there is an intermediary, uh, the, the source of the data should be uh, credited correctly. Uh, this is very important, I think, for the grant of the providers. Um, on, the, um, on what you said uh, here, the, I also had a comment, but I don't remember now. Um, 
Many. There are so many things to comment. It will, it, will, it will come back. Uh, yeah. But uh, on the citizen science, I agree with you that usually they are of good quality, better than we think, because the people who do that are passionate and they have some scientific, uh, either some patient for what they do or some scientific background. And usually uh, the citizen science uh, data um, I heard about, uh, the, the scientists were quite um, positively surprised by the quality of the data, including I remember a presentation uh, on long series and data rescue, where people to calibrate some uh, long series for climate change. I'd look for uh, uh, data from three or 400 years uh, in the past, and they were amazingly surprised by the quality because it was collected by scientists. Oh, uh, yes, and um, you were talking about, uh, well, never mind, if we come back. Yeah, let, <laughs> don't worry, thanks. Um, I think uh, we wanted also um, Orestes. I just don't want to complete uh, the session without having a look again at the role, let's say, of Eurogeo in this context. That's particularly important, I mean, I think for the whole community, for us also in view of the new project that will start on the Secretariat, we'd like to support them as well in, in, in giving some recommendations. So yeah, I, I would like to come back to them, but uh, Orestes, please. Uh, yes, sometimes when you want to make a party, you know, and you start uh, discussing with all the people in the room, it's very hard to arrange a party. So perhaps you need a critical mass of two or three people to just go ahead. This means that perhaps we shouldn't be, look, be, be trying to convince every in situ provider out there. Perhaps we should first focus on the ones that really want to contribute and they cannot. They don't know what a data catalog is. They have their local XLS uh, files in local PCs and, uh, you know, that's it. So this is a culture that has been going on for a long time. So perhaps we should focus first our efforts on the people that want to provide but don't, don't know how to do this. So this is my first point. I was wondering, uh, regarding the, the European data spaces, there is a lot of talk of data sovereignty. You already mentioned this. Does, if we can make sure that a, 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 a car driver his sovereign of his data and the Volkswagen won't use it in so, such, a, such a manner. Is there a technical solution? Is there a policy solution that we could steal from the, strat the 2020 strategy, that, uh, digital strategy of Europe to bring in here regarding legacy, I don't know, or a, te a technology, blockchain, I don't know, to ensure the legacy. So this is my second uh, point. And the third is the C squared. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. The, the Copernicus Institute has a, a fantastic database. The GREX is kind of an expansion of this, is a geo expansion, let's call it like this. Does this room know of this uh, database? If not, perhaps, you know, it, it's, this is an issue for uh, EuroGeo. Perhaps we should rebrand actually GEO and put an asterisk, not only uh, remote sensing data, but this is, uh, yeah, a small thought. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I will give you the floor just um, about two of the things, then I will give you the floor. Um, yeah, with respect to the first thing, little by little, or first, I, I agree. I mean, I think that, I think this should be linked to which kind of use cases we are focusing on. And, and, and I mean, we, we really need to, to focus. Uh, it's a, the in situ data, data landscape is extremely, um, wide. Um, and yeah, in, uh, with respect to um, the CS Square, which is, stands for Copernicus in situ component information set, uh, system, which is basically a database of requirements for in situ data for the Copernicus products. It's a very, let's say, technical tool, very focused on how, which kind of data, which kind of requirements, uh, in situ requirements need each of the products of the Copernicus portfolio. And we have used this as a blueprint for GREX, which I would believe that could be a very good contribution as well uh, from the EuroGeo community to GEO and EuroGeo. Uh, but of course, we need a clear use cases there or, or, or target, let's say, focus um, to, to work on, on that. Um, and that's why, for example, now in the context of the in-case project, uh, we are focusing on a few geo uh, work program initiatives to discuss with them which kind of issues they have. Now what we need to know, and I 
look at the, uh, let's say, in situ data users, it's like how useful this could be. Um, and that's something that we, we, we could discuss. But I'll give you the floor. Um, yeah, so I, I actually, um, I'm going to follow on from what you've just said, actually, Jose Miguel, and, and respond to Arrestis, because um, one of the things we're working on at the moment um, with the Geo Secretariat is um, it became very clear from conversations we had within the Envry cluster that the reason that many of the research infrastructures are not exposing their data via the Geos portal is because they don't know how to. So we are currently developing a use case using the European Plate Observing System to demonstrate how to do this, because one of the, the issues for some of the data providers is exactly what you highlighted, Arrestis, that they don't know how to actually be a GEOS data provider. But I think the role for EuroGeo here is the, the, the reason that connection was made with EPOS is because I have a role in a research infrastructure and I have a role in GEO. So what we need to do now is find out what are the other, who are the other data providers who actually want to, would very much like to deliver their data via GEO, but they don't know how to. And I think that's probably a role that you, you know, that's a space for, for where Euro, Euro Geo can be act, active as well. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, yeah. Paolo and then Elna. Yeah, yeah, very, very shortly concerning these, uh, what you said about becoming a data provider in GEO. I must say that uh, some years ago, we had uh, a very good support from the GEO Secretariat. They actually reached out to the communities, helped them to, 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 to start the procedure, and then they contacted us. I must say that this support was basically ended. And so now we are often contacted directly, and we have to follow the, 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 the inverse procedure. So we redirect them to the Geo Secretariat for the formal application. So I agree that EuroGeo could do this at least for the European provider. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's... Uh, just, uh, just quickly, um, now, because as a researcher, I respond to, the, uh, to this concern that the researchers don't, uh, don't, uh, don't want to share their in-situ measurements. That's, that's correct. Uh, there is there is there is a culture between researchers that they don't want to share their uh, their data, or even when they share it, they do in a way that you cannot use it. Um, I personally have a dis, uh, uh, have this experience, but on the other hand, I have I have a sympathy that when they do the hard field work, they train uh, for for months to use certain instruments. They do to, uh, for a couple of months uh, to the fieldwork to collect the data, and they process the data for a couple of months. They don't want like this share the data with uh, with uh, with the community. But I think that we have to work on it. There are easy solutions that provide the, some deadlines. If your researchers uh, cannot provide the scientific paper after five or six years, it means that he or he cannot. So. Uh, there, sh there should be some time wind uh, a window for them that after such a time they uh, they share this data with the community um, I, it just came to my mind uh, and I'm thinking for a while about that but uh, the, this is uh, this is a real uh, uh, real uh, problems that even the researchers uh, when they want to they know that other researchers have certain data they struggle to convince them to share those data with them. But on the other hand, there is some responsibility toward the Commission as well. Uh, commission funded uh, many initiatives. Some of these uh, initiatives, they collect the data, but still this data uh, that the provider obliged to share with the community is not shared. So the monitoring of these sharing system should be, uh, should be uh, you know, take it seriously. Um, even some research project, uh, project or grant that uh, the PI received million euros that is still with uh, come up with different, uh, you know, uh, excuse to postpone this uh, data sharing. Yeah. I don't know who was first. <laughs> so I can make it very quick, and it is very short. And then we go to it. So going back to what Stefan said before, I and, and addressing the comment you've just made, I think the publishers are now going to take a lead on this. I'm an editor for um, a geoscience journal. Um, I'm also vice president of EGU, and we have just instigated a 
no data, no publication policy. This is going to become increasingly the common practice. It means if you don't publish your data with the journal article, you won't get published. And I know nature is now also going in the same direction. So I think the publishers will force the issue. Exactly. These are, ex these are really excellent points, also the ones you're making, but I do remember there is still the option in nature, I think, maybe they will take away, but there is still the option which a lot of researchers use, and this is data sharing by email. And then they provide the yeah, email and you will never get an email from that person. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting rid of that, they're getting rid of that. Except, so that's great. But except, and that was common practice, and that's the additional um, practice uh, researchers use. They want to be on the paper because what's the incentive of a researcher now? You're measured still by impact factor, and this is a big problem. We need to get rid of being measured by impact factors because the more publications you have, if you give your data, data out, you will do it on the condition that you're an author of the paper, and that's a big problem in, in the research field. Just, just to complete yes, the, the full also, story. Also there so is a re, uh, you stay, you stay exactly. So we need. So we need. I finish. So we need other incentives. They are changing. So this is great. We need to get rid of the impact factor to some degree or measure it differently. And we need to create another incentive, which is when you actually share the data, then you are acknowledged in another way, and you get kind of brownie points, bonus points when you share the data. So we need to change the current incentives for the researchers. Um, yeah, very shortly, and then we, we go yes. to. Uh, the, it is, at that point of the publishing uh, uh, the papers, there is a legal issue behind that. And this is even discussed between researchers, because many times some of this data is not uh, our data. It's, it's handover from the collaborator, and yeah. we are not allowed to share it even though we want to publish the result, and even though we, uh, we are the first author and corresponding author. So yeah. that's, I, I don't know, I hope it works, but I, I have some concern about that. Yeah, I think Lionel. Yeah, uh, yeah, some, yeah, some point I've listed, that are being sometimes touched upon by the, the panelists and the people in the room. So regarding contribution of potential Eurogeo to institute, so trust, and transparency, it has been mentioned by France, of course, it's crucial and this could be addressed by Eurogeo. Then I think that could be a good things to create what we call basic knowledge regarding in situ best practices. And there we have easy low hanging fruit connecting existing dots. So GREX has been mentioned, but we have all relying on data management, data sharing principles. So you know that we have released a self assessment tool, which is available on Geo uh, Knowledge Hub. So Starting with this first exercise, let's see how it applies to in-situ measurement. Then you have the requirements. Then there's already an existing contribution to move from what has been touched as well by uh, uh, the panelists regarding the poor encoding. So moving from CSV to very nice documented type of format that enable interoperability. And by the way, what we have done using NetCDF, so now it has versed by the DAB and available on the Geo web portal. So again, in practice, and all of this can be gathered in so-called basic knowledge about, about um, in-situ best practices. So creating a minimum in-situ knowledge package could definitely help. So you need to be aware of this, this, and this. It should be easily promoted under uh, uh, Eurogeo. It could be generalized, of course, to all geo as a whole. And I think it could be some, what you mentioned, small and little step by step. And it's easy. It's basically on our hand. And this basically can move the whole institute community forward. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Lionel. It's very, very good. Uh, we also come back to the uh, to how uh, we could respond to this within the context of Eurogeo. Uh, I'm looking at the time. It's exactly six. Um, yeah, Gregory, very uh, quick. Well, ju just a quick comment also yes. about Ellen's comment about capacity building. I remember yeah. a few years ago with Paolo, Lionel, and other colleagues. We and also Mark. We had project where we contributed to a capacity building material to support data provider to provide their, their data into the geo system. So it was more satellite data oriented, but it's still alive. Right? It's the bringing geo services, services into practice workshop. We thought, thought more, more than 1,000 people across Europe 
in providing data to GEOS. So maybe we can re revitalize this material and add an in situ component into it. Yeah, that's uh, something that's one of our um, proposals here. Well, it's a bit uh, here more focused on templates, but uh, it can be guidelines, can be awareness raising, capacity building material. Uh, that's something that I believe you could have a who have a, a role here. Um, I I think we, we close at six, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Um, I mean, we could. I, I believe for all the interventions. I don't know if I, I think we get many messages. Maybe it was all jumping around, but I think we got many interesting uh, ideas. Uh, maybe Franz, the last uh, comment uh, for the commission. Yeah, it should be okay. I have a because I've seen a question because. Um, my feeling is from discussions I heard, I've been in a workshop from ESA, the satellite people. My impression was they're often not aware what is there in terms of, of in situ data, which is available, which has quality flex from a lot of research infrastructure from networks like Actress, like TCON, like ICOS, where ICOS is probably just the well known ones, but some are less well known. So it's not, I don't believe it's to a first place a technological thing that you need yeah. a broker to translate different uh, title formats into each other. It is a matter of information and, and yeah. sharing of information ar around what is there. And we had this discussion also before, somebody saying there's so many things there, but nobody, you know, hardly anybody knows it because there's a lack of, of communication, these things. And I, yeah. I believe that's definitely also something where, where where Eurogeo can yeah. can play a major role in, in in helping just distributing this information rather than providing some technological fixes to certain issues. Yeah, I, I would I would agree I would agree I would agree with you. I, of course, there is a technical interoperability component to it in certain contexts, but I think uh, in Europe we we also face, and I can see from with my companions in situ hat that sometimes it's just they. they Interested entities are not really aware about the data exists that the projects exist, and we we have um, we are, for example, preparing catalogs of of, of which activities are uh, collecting in situ data in the Arctic. We are also now uh, trying to do something related to reservoir data, basically because we, there is a need for having this kind of an overview, and I think that could be a, an excellent synergy uh, between. Uh, and the activities that we do there in situ and Eurogeo to try to yeah, publicize, to give uh, visibility to these kind of activities uh, and to put it there. I think that gentleman at the end wanted to uh, say. <laughs> I, I no, no, it's fine. Don't worry. I'll come back to that. It's actually very short. There is a lot of awareness about in situ with the satellite agencies because I work in the CEO's uh, working group, Calval, and, and these things are discussed on length there. But but one short question, really, I, I was not here, maybe that was clarified at the beginning of the session, but what is your definition of in situ? And what is the non in situ data called? That we, we didn't we didn't enter into that definition. Uh, we uh, I, I applied at least for me uh, the what the definition that we have in Copernicus uh, program, which is basically everything which is not satellite uh, imagery data, basically. And we typically divide, and I think uh, yeah, uh, Stefan presented it nicely, also taking it from Copernicus. Uh, we divide typically the observation measurements, uh, and we also have the typical geospatial data, which this kind of map Your data. Uh, well, yeah, yeah but uh, <laughs> it's uh, the definition that works uh, so far in, uh, uh, at least in the context of Copernicus, of course. Uh, what we try to do beyond the discussion about terminology is just to try to provide the data that they need. We can call it. Yeah, we can call, we can label it whatever, but uh, we we what is important is that they um, we try to support them with the accessing of this type of data. Um, I think we need to close uh, soon. So I, I'm you, gonna, yeah, I'm please. just going to say quickly. One thing is the cluster of environmental research infrastructures also uses the Copernicus definition of 
in situ, which is basically everything that's not come, that doesn't come from a satellite. And we've basically taken that from, from what's the generally accepted understanding. But I also wanted to come back to the issue about um, people being aware of data. So this is, the, this is what triggered the idea of using one of the research infrastructures as a use case for how we can get better visibility of all of the research infrastructures in the cluster, which includes, includes ICOS and ACTRIS. And this is why in a conversation with the Secretariat, we decided the best way to do this was to go through the whole process of you know, what needs to be done in order to actually expose a, the research infrastructure's data via GEOS, and then point to this for other research infrastructures to say, this is how easy it was when you know what to do. And, and I, if there's documentation around that helps us with this process that we can share more widely, that's even better. But obviously the research infrastructures are European research infrastructures. So I think there is a role for Eurogeo here because there are other research infrastructures outside the Envry cluster that have data that fills the gap. So if we can then broaden that context, I think that's another role for Eurogeo as well. Good. I think we really need to, uh, just a last comment because we <laughs> will need to, to wrap up. Okay. Uh, do you consider the error of ground uh, measurements? Because it's some years ago, it was saying the ground truth. There is no ground truth, but still the error exists. And uh, one way of collecting this ground data is not enough, uh, because what doesn't mean that everything that is not uh, by satellites, you know, there are the maps that uh, every country has of the planners and that was from the geodesies, etc. But there is a lot of error over there because it has been done not using satellites, for instance. So all boundaries, etc., could be shifted. And then, so if you say, because there was, I think, in Stefan saying that uh, biomass, you know, in biomass, what does it mean, biomass? Yes, biomass could be uh, wet, could be dry biomass, uh, by whom is it measured, uh, etc. So uh, that's a point thing and uh, many measurements, ground measurements are point measurements. So where uh, point measurements are also, uh, also not very good and uh, how to upscale it, etc, etc. So that's a uh, that's a huge subject like ocean and uh, i think it's not enough to rely on one sources thank you i yeah. don't want to but i have some experience in ground measurements not ground truth and i come back to the same place several times yeah i think i think yeah i think uh, i think it's uh, maybe if someone wants to say something very quickly and then I we mean, really wrap up. May, <laughs> since you mentioned the presentation. Um, no, no, of course, I mean, the more, I think I was attending actually a validation workshop from CEOs two weeks ago in the, in the US and there was also a discussion on what they call reference data. And of course, the more information on the hour you can give, that's many times not available, but if that's possible, the better. So if you can add some information about the quality to your in situ data, and the more you can do that, uh, the better it is. And it is best practice to do that if possible. Thanks, uh, everyone. I think a big round of applause to all the panelists. And, uh, And uh, I think we will have more discussion uh, about uh, activities that uh, we could do in the context of in situ within Eurogeo. I think there are many topics that we can cover, so I think we have worked for <laughs> many, many years. Uh, but thanks a lot. Have a nice evening and see you tomorrow. And thank you, Jose Miguel.